Greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Welcome everyone to our program. And this week, our virtual field trip is going to look at the career of a very interesting man and a very fine ball player in his day, Jim Mudcat Grant. He was not a Hall of Fame pitcher, but he was a very good pitcher. And I think more importantly, a culturally significant player. And we're going to explain uh, exactly why that is. In much the same way that a Buck O'Neill did right up until his death, Mudcat Grant has served as an unofficial ambassador for the game of baseball. He has made public appearances. Uh, he has made many appearances speaking to school children and has generally done a terrific job of promoting the history of black baseball, uh, both in inner cities and also in other locations. He's been a frequent visitor to Cooperstown. Uh, we've had him here uh, for uh, previous programs. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, it was a memorable experience for me getting a chance to meet Mudcat back in 2004. Four years ago, it was February 8th, 2016, Whittier College conveyed an honorary doctorate of humane letters on Jim Mudcat Grant citing him for the exemplary way that he overcame discrimination and his continuing efforts in researching the history of African-American baseball. And this is an honor that not many major league players have received during the course of their career. Now, by the time that Grant graduated from high school, he was born and raised in a town called Lacucci, Florida. But by the time that he graduated from high school, the Negro Leagues had really seen their heyday come and go. He signed with a major league team, the Cleveland Indians in 1954. This was 11 years before the amateur draft was put into place. In 54, he began a steady four-year climb through the Indians minor league system. Uh, it was also while he was in the minor leagues that a teammate nicknamed him Mudcat. And the reason the teammate did that was uh, not the nicest reason. Apparently, the teammate said to Jim Grant, as he was known at the time, that he was as ugly as a Mississippi catfish. So that's how Mudcat got the nickname. And even though I'm sure he didn't appreciate it at the beginning, uh, he would eventually embrace the nickname. And that's how most people know him today, not as Jim Grant, but as Mudcat Grant. Now, he made the Indians opening day roster in 1958, and he pitched very creditably in 44 games, including 28 starts. One of the really significant things that happened to Mudcat during his rookie year, he roomed with a veteran star and a Hall of Famer named Larry Doby. And of course, Larry Doby was the first man to break the color barrier in the American League going back to 1947. Also, Doby just so happened to have been Mudcat Grant's idol when Mudcat was a youngster. So we have a quote here uh, from Mudcat Grant. Part of the quote we have on the screen, but not the entire quote because it is rather lengthy, but I do want to read it to you. And here is what Grant said about rooming with Larry Doby. So I got in the room and the rest of the players were still at the ballpark. And then Larry, Larry Doby, came in a little bit later. Larry said, well, you must be Mudcat Grant. I said, yes, sir, Mr. Doby. He then asked, do you like that bet over there? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Doby. He then said, uh, we're going to have to get rid of this way that you keep saying, yes, sir, Mr. Doby. And I said to him, yes, sir, Mr. Doby. Now, Mudcat went on to say that Doby taught me just about everything. I know the history of Larry Doby because late at night, Larry would pace throughout the room. He would yell, he would even scream. This is how he would overcome some of the difficulties that he had to go through. I know it was difficult. And then he taught me, this is what you're gonna have to face as a black player. You've got to face it. And when you cross the white lines, you better win. It ain't about, oh, this is so bad for me. You better win because if you don't win, it's goodbye. See you later. So 
Larry Doby really became a strong influence on Mudcat Grant. Grant saw the struggles that he went through, but he also took the advice about how it was important to work hard, do your best, and ultimately to succeed so that you could stay in the major leagues for a while. Now, on the field, Mudcat finally graduated to a full-time starting role in 1961. That's when he gave the Indians 15 wins and 244 innings. Now, he alternated bad and good years in 1962 and 63. And that frustrated the Indians somewhat. It was really kind of a series of fits and starts. He would struggle for a while, then pitch well. They thought, oh, he's made a breakthrough. And then he would struggle again. Well, the situation reached a boiling point in 1964. That's when Mudcat started the season so badly that the Indians decided to make a change. At the old June 15th trading deadline, Cleveland dealt Grant to the Minnesota Twins for a package of pitcher Lee Stang and an infield outfield prospect named George Banks. And this would turn out to be the steal of the decade for the Minnesota Twins franchise. Well, the move to Minnesota really rejuvenated Mudcat Grant. With a new pitching coach and a better supporting cast of players behind him, Grant blossomed into stardom. The Twins made Mudcat a full-time starter. They watched him spin a 2.82 ERA. And the situation only improved from there. In 1965, the Twins hired a guy named Johnny Sane to be their pitching coach. Some regard Johnny Sane as the greatest pitching coach in the history of the game. If you want to be more conservative about it, maybe one of the top five pitching coaches, but a guy that helped so many pitchers, especially during those years in Minnesota. Sane's influence helped Grant become a workhorse. He made 39 starts in 1965, completed 14 games, and led the league with six shutouts and 21 wins. The latter statistic, those 21 wins, put Grant in the record books as he became the first black pitcher in Major League history, uh, American League history, I should say. The first had been Don Newcomb with the Brooklyn Dodgers. But Mudcat became the first black pitcher in American League history to register 20 wins in a single season. Now, with Grant leading the rotation, the Twins won the American League pennant. And they earned a World Series berth against a really good Los Angeles Dodgers team. At the time, the Dodgers featured twin aces, two Hall of Famers, Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale. You can see Mudcat, uh, this I believe prior to the series starting, posing for a photo with Double D, Don Drysdale, at that year's World Series. Now, Grant did all that he could in the series. Uh, he won two of three starts against L.A., even in a home run. Ultimately, though, the Twins fell short in seven very tough games. Now, it's interesting to note that Minnesota Twins staff was a very talented staff. They had pitchers like Jim Cott, and yet Mudcat Grant was the ace of the staff. He really was the key pitcher for Minnesota and a huge factor in them winning the pennant and coming within a game of winning the world championship. Now, after the 1965 season, Mudcat went into a more difficult period of time. Uh, he slumped in 1966 and 67. In the meantime, the twins were plagued by racial division within the clubhouse. Some of it may have been fostered by the front office as well. Mudcat also became very unhappy with his contract situation. So all of this led to a trade in 1967. This was a trade that sent him and one-time MVP shortstop Zoilo Versailles to the Los Angeles Dodgers. And you can see a couple of photos here, baseball card from Topps showing Mudcat with the Dodgers, and then a photo of him actually wearing uh, Dodger blue. Now, the Dodgers had a very good starting rotation, and they had enough depth at the time that they could move Mudcat to the bullpen. So he went to the, the, the relief corps, and he really thrived there. He did very well. 
really impressed Walter Alston, the manager, with his work ethic, his determination. Now, he did well for the Dodgers, but ultimately the Dodgers had a tremendous glut of pitching, both in the rotation and in the bullpen. And they had no room on their roster to protect Mudcat from the expansion draft. Now, you had four teams coming in to the major leagues in 1969. In the National League, you had the Montreal Expos and the San Diego Padres. In the American League, you had the Kansas City Royals and the Seattle Pilots. Now, the two National League expansion teams, Montreal and San Diego, would have a chance to select players from the established National League teams that were not protected. Mudcat was among those players not protected by the Dodgers. So after the 1968 season, the expansion draft takes place. Sure enough, the Montreal Expos, they take Mudcat Grant with one of their expansion selections. Now, the selection of Mudcat led to a little bit of controversy in the spring, 1969. This was during the first spring training for the Expos franchise. So Mudcat reports to the Expos training camp in West Palm Beach, Florida. One of Grant's teammates was veteran shortstop Maury Wills. Maury, like Mudcat, African-American. One day, Maury Wills goes to a local bar in West Palm Beach with a sports writer and a photographer. Wills, almost immediately after entering the establishment, is immediately asked to leave, quote, because they didn't serve colored people, end quote. Now, keep in mind, this is 1969. This is five years after the Civil Rights Act has been passed. But we still see the remnants of Jim Crow segregation still persisting, especially in the South. Again, this was Florida. And this is still affecting major league players, even established major league players. Maury Wills had been a star in earlier years with the Los Angeles Dodgers. He'd have those great years, uh, you know, stealing bases, setting the table for the Dodgers, was a huge part of their championship run in the 1960s. Well, here's even a star player, simply because of his, the color of his skin, being told, uh, you've got to leave the bar. Now, Grant, who himself had experienced uh, tremendous racism throughout the 1950s and 60s, and often attended civil rights rallies, could not let the situation with Wills lie in 1969. I want to go back just a little bit with Mudcat and his own history. When Mudcat grew up in Florida, he grew up in relative poverty. Uh, his family lived in a very small, very modest house. And they lived in an area where there was a tremendous racism, there were essentially white supremacists that lived near where Mudcat lived. And at times, they actually would kind of invade the Grant household. And when Mudcat's family saw these guys coming and knew that they were obviously there to cause trouble, potentially do harm to the family, the family actually, what they did was they had a trap door I believe it was in their living room on the first floor. And they actually would go into that trap door and hide in the basement, hide in the lower level. I'm not even sure it was a, a full basement. It may have just been more like a crawl space than anything else. But they literally would hide going through that trap door in order to avoid any kind of violent encounter uh, with these racists living in their neighborhood. So obviously racism, something in Mudcat had been familiar with going back to his childhood days. And it was something that persisted even after he signs with the Cleveland Indians, um, especially pitching minor league ballparks in the South, experiencing Jim Crow segregation. So he was all too familiar with this. So let's go back to 1969. The situation with Maury Wills really upset Mudcat. Now, He's also a native of Florida, so this is really hitting home with him. He writes a letter of protest to the governor of the state of Florida, Claude Kirk. 
And as Grant explained in an interview with the Associated Press, this is what he said, Wills is an outstanding citizen of this country. He should be accepted as a citizen, not as a black man, who has to be told that he can't do this or that. So here's a guy who stood up for his, for his teammate, stood up for civil rights, stood up for really the morally correct approach to the situation. In terms of on the field, Grant's pitching, um, not only good enough to make the Expos opening day roster, but they decided to make him their opening day starting pitcher. Now, in reality, the Expos, you know, they're a new franchise. They're young, they're building. They really did not need a 33-year-old veteran, you know, taking up X number of starts in the starting rotation for their team. So in June, the Expos decided to trade off their would-be ace. And they sent him in a deal to the St. Louis Cardinals for a journeyman reliever in Gary Waslusi. Grant finished out the season in relative obscurity, mostly pitching in middle relief for an also-ran Cardinals team uh, that would not be going to the postseason. Now, in, in 1968, Cardinals were really good. You know, they had advanced to the World Series. They took a three games to one lead on the Detroit Tigers and then ultimately lost the World Series. They fell in the final three games. But 1969 did not go nearly as well. Um, age started to catch up with the team, injuries, that sort of thing. So they really much were an also-ran team. And Mudcat became an afterthought on a team that was not part of the pennant race. So this leads to another trade. Mudcat would become very familiar with trades as he frequently moved from one team to another. So he is sent in a deal um, to the Oakland A's. And that is where he pitches in 1970. And really pitches brilliantly out of the Oakland bullpen. He emerges as their relief ace. Today we call the relief ace the closer. Back then, you would call him the relief face, the fireman, uh, sometimes the stopper. They didn't really use the term closer at that time, but that's essentially what Mudcat Grant was. In addition to pitching really well on the mound, Grant also did something very important off the field. And this rarely gets talked about. And I think it's important to emphasize this. Grant worked with a young pitcher by the name of Roland Fingers, who'd soon become better known as Raleigh Fingers. Raleigh Fingers was a top-notch pitching prospect with the Oakland A's franchise. The A's had tried him as a starter, but he got very nervous before each of his starts. You know, he, he knew what day he'd be starting, and he'd get very much worked up. And he'd, he'd get so nervous, he worked himself up into a lather. And by the time the game started, uh, he had kind of used up a lot of his energy and he wasn't really effective. So what the A's decided to do, they eventually would make him um, their relief face. And this, this happened um, a little bit later on. And it was Mudcat Grant who really took Raleigh Fingers under his wing. And he taught the young right-hander how to approach pitching as a reliever and how different it was from being a starter. And some of it was just real basic stuff. How do you properly warm up? How do you warm up quickly so that if the manager you know, calls down to the bullpen, you're going to be ready to go in the game? And he also told him uh, how to mentally prepare for pitching that particular day. Once it became obvious that he was going to get called upon, Mudcat would work with him on that mental preparation. And this really helped Raleigh Fingers. And essentially, Mudcat Grant laid the groundwork for Fingers to succeed as Oakland's relief ace. And of course, he would go on to become one of just a handful of full-time relievers honored here in Cooperstown. Now, this showed a lot of character on the part of Mudcat Grant because basically he was grooming his own replacement. 
And once it became obvious that, you know, Raleigh Fingers and some of the other young relievers in Oakland were going to be able to step up and do the job, well, Mudcat became expendable. And this is what often, ha often happens with veteran players. You know, they help young players, a lot of times the young players who are going to replace them, either that year or in the near future. So Mudcat now becomes expendable. And in mid-September of 1970, uh, the Oakland A's decide to trade him. Of course, he was a veteran pitcher. He was making a decent amount of money at the time. So they send him to the Pittsburgh Pirates in a trade for a young outfield prospect named Angel Mangual. Now, Oakland writers reacted to this trade with varying degrees of shock. Some speculated that the move came about simply because the A's owner, Charlie Finley, who essentially ran the team, they had heard that Finley became aware that Grant had made a facetious remark on radio about ownership interfering with the manager in Oakland. Well, this was, um, it was a relatively inconsequential remark a humorous throwaway line. Really, that's how Mudcat intended it. But Charlie Finley appears to have taken this a little bit more seriously. And he felt that one of his own players, Mudcat Grant, was insulting him in public over the radio. So that may have been a factor. So Mudcat ends up going to the Pittsburgh Pirates toward the tail end of the 1970 season. And Mudcat really kind of found a new home in Pittsburgh. The Pirates were a heavily integrated team at that time. About half of the club was white, and about the other half was black and or Latino. They were pretty much the most racially integrated team in all of baseball back in 1970 and 71. Uh, the Bucks ended up winning the National League East in 1970, before they lost in the championship series. But in 1971, Grant returns, the Pirates are even better, and the Pirates end up um, winning the pennant. Unfortunately, Mudcat Grant would not last the entire season in Pittsburgh. The Pirates had a very overcrowded bullpen. They had a lot of good relievers. They had Dave Justy, who was their uh, closer. Um, they had uh, several other effective relief pitchers. Uh, they had uh, Bob Moose and Bruce Keeson, guys that could switch between the bullpen and the starting rotation. Most of these guys were younger than Mudcat as well. So once again, Mudcat becomes expendable. And on August 10th, the Pirates sell Mudcat's contract back to the Oakland A's. And this would turn out to be one of those bad breaks of which players don't really have a lot of control. The Pirates were on their way to winning the National League East title. They were actually on their way to winning the World Series. They would defeat the heavily favored Baltimore Orioles in seven very tough games. But Mudcat would lose out on that opportunity. I think he did get a World Series share. Um, I'm not sure if he ever got a World Series ring because he was not with the team in September and October. But obviously he was not there when the team clinched the division when they won the pennant against the Giants, and then ultimately when they won the World Series against the Baltimore Orioles. So now he is back in Oakland for a second time. Now, 1971, Mudcat again pitches very well for the A's. But A's owner Charlie Finley, looking to cut some salary after the 1971 season, releases Mudcat Grant. He had pitched exceptionally well. Obviously, based on talent and efficiency, Mudcat deserved to come back for the 1972 season. But Finley, who was known for not giving out a lot of money to his players at the time, again, this is the era before free agency, he decides to save some salary. Now, he does offer Mudcat an assignment to pitch in the minor leagues for Oakland's AAA affiliate in Iowa. Mudcat eventually would accept that assignment. He would spend the entire 1972 season pitching in the minor leagues, pitching at AAA. And he pitched very well, but he never got called up to Oakland 
during the season. And again, this is another one of these examples of cruel fate because in 1972, the Oakland A's were on their way to winning the American League West, and they were also on their way to winning the first of three consecutive World Series. So an odd situation, two straight years, Mudcat is part of an organization that's heading to a World Series championship. And in the case of the Pirates, he's dispatched in August. And in the case of the Oakland A's, he's kept in the minor leagues all year. So again, denied an opportunity to win a world championship. Uh, we talked about this card, this image of uh, Jim Mudcat Grant that came out, the uh, 1972 top set. Um, very distinctive card as it shows uh, Mudcat with his uh, mutton chop uh, sideburns. And those helped make him one of the more distinctive looking players in Major League Baseball. And there's, I guess, a little bit of irony here. Um, you know, Mudcat has his own baseball card in 1972, but did not pitch a single a game in the majors that season. 1973 comes around, Mudcat receives a spring training invitation from his original team, the Cleveland Indians. So they bring him to camp, but he fails to make the opening day roster. Instead of going back to the minor leagues for another season, Mudcat opts for retirement. So a long major league career that had begun in 1958 officially comes to an end in the spring of 1973. But in some ways, that's where the story of Mudcat Grant is just really starting to get underway. It's because of what he did after his playing days. Now, he's out of baseball, but Mudcat has other interests. Something he had started doing in the 1960s was pursuing another one of his talents as a musician. In fact, go back to 1965 after Mudcat and the Minnesota Twins play in the World Series, Mudcat was invited to appear on two different national talk shows, uh, the Johnny Carson Tonight Show and the Mike Douglas Show. And on each of the programs, Mudcat performed some of his blues music. Mudcat was the front man for a musical group called Mudcat and the Kittens, great name for the band. So this was something, now that he's out of baseball, he's able to pursue his musical interests on uh, more of a full-time basis. Now, he also did get back into baseball relatively soon after that. Uh, he becomes a broadcaster, first for the Indians and then for the Oakland A's. Then as we move into the 1980s, this is when Mudcat really starts making a difference in the community. He begins to operate a nationwide program called Slugout Illiteracy, Slugout Drugs. It was an organization based out of Los Angeles, where he was living at the time. And this was a place where he encouraged former players to put forth an anti-drug message during instructional clinics. So the clinics would offer instruction in baseball to young kids. But there was also the anti-drug message. There was also the encouragement for kids to read, to learn how to read and write properly. And this is really where we start to see the beginning of Mudcat's philanthropic efforts. Now, another thing that he started to do also in the 1980s, he started to become involved with the Major League Baseball Players Alumni Association. Mudcat became very concerned about some of the guys that he had played with back in the 50s, the 60s, and the early 70s. He knew that some of these players were struggling with financial problems, with medical problems. So Mudcat became very active as a board member for the Major League Baseball Players Alumni Association, which actually started in the early 1980s. And Mudcat because he had knew a lot of people in baseball, very outgoing guy, a lot of connections. If former players, maybe guys that he had played with or against, or maybe some players uh, 
that had played even earlier than him, if he got wind that these players were having trouble, Mudcat would try to help them. Uh, and it was through the, the Alumni Association uh, that he did this. Um, they would try to uh, raise money, take donations. If a player needed to get into alcohol rehabilitation or drug rehabilitation, Mudcat would make some calls, try to make sure that would happen. One of the players that Mudcat Grant tried to help was a guy named Leon Wagner. Leon Wagner was a very good hitting outfielder with the California Angels back in the 1960s. And he was a very popular player. Like Mudcat, he was very outgoing, very colorful. Uh, he actually had a clothing store uh, that uh, he ran, that he owned. Uh, Daddy Wags was the name of the clothing store because that was Leon Wagner's nickname. But after his playing days, um, Leon Wagner fell into very hard times. You know, he made a couple of appearances in films, including um, the uh, movie about the Negro Leagues, uh, the Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars. But aside from that, he struggled to find regular work. Um, he became unemployed. He fell into drug abuse and at one point became homeless and destitute. And one of the people that led the effort to try to help Leon Wagner was Mudcat Grant. Mudcat would set Wagner up with jobs in fantasy camps, and he would also even arrange places for him to live, uh, apartments, rental houses. So Mudcat pretty much did whatever he could to try to help out Leon Wagner. In the short term, it certainly did help him, but ultimately Wagner fell back into this life of addiction. Uh, he was homeless and he actually, uh, he died in the streets. He literally, his body was found, uh, I believe in an electrical shed in Los Angeles. And he had a very, very rough end to his life. But it was not for a lack of trying on the part of Mudcat Grant. And this was just one of many players that Mudcat tried uh, to help. In the case of Wagner, it didn't work out. For other players, um, it worked out much, much better. So this gives you a sense of the kind of guy that Mudcat Grant has been uh, throughout his life. Now, he's done some other things, too. He eventually authored a book, came out in 2006, and it's called The Black Aces. It is about all of the African-American pitchers who have won 20 more games in a single season. You can see the cover on the left side of your screen, and you can see a few of the pic uh, pitchers uh, shown here, um, either African-American or African-Canadian, because you have Ferguson Jenkins in the upper left-hand corner, uh, Vita Blue, Dave Stewart, Bob Gibson, another Hall of Famer shown here, Dwight Gooden, uh, J.R. Richard, Dontrell Willis, uh, Mike Norris, Don Newcomb, Al Downing, and a couple of other guys as well. So all of these uh, pitchers who had won 20 or more games, and at the time there were 12, eventually, after the book came out, uh, three other pitchers were able to win 20 games in a season. We can see their names here, Dontrell Willis, David Price, and CC Sabathia, who was our guest not that long ago uh, for the 100th anniversary celebration of the Negro Leagues. So these are the 15 uh, black aces, so to speak, all winning at least 20 games in one season. And although Mudcat is one of them, the reason he wrote the book was not really to salute himself. It was to honor all of these other guys and what they had accomplished. Um, another thing that Mudcat has been doing um, in recent years, uh, he has made a great effort to try to reach out to youngsters. Um, he has tried to get young African-Americans, young African-American students to read about baseball, to read and research baseball's African-American history. And this is a cause that Mudcat uh, has really been devoted to um, probably since uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s. And Mudcat's 
accomplishments, his efforts in this area uh, have even received attention from the White House. Mudcat was once invited to the White House along with the other uh, black aces. And at the time, the president was George W. Bush, and he praised Mudcat Grant for his, quote, courage, his character, and his perseverance. So you think about players who have been summoned to the White House and have had a president speak about them publicly. Not that many. Um, Mudcat Grant is uh, one of those gentlemen. Now, all of this brings us to the chance that I had to meet Mudcat Grant for the first time. And this was 16 years ago, it was 2004, and it was right here at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And I was fortunate enough to meet not only Mudcat Grant, but also his former Pirates teammate, Al Oliver. And Al Oliver joined us for a program back in the spring. What happened was um, the education department, which at the time was run by uh, Jeff Arnett, invited Mudcat and Al Oliver to come to the Hall of Fame in February for a special program to celebrate Black History Month. Now, this is February in Cooperstown. It can get a little rough in terms of the weather, the cold, the snow. Sometimes hard to get players to come up, ex-players to come up during this time of year. But Mudcat and Al were both very receptive and both eagerly accepted our invitations to come here in February of 2004. Now, I had long been a fan of Mudcat Grant. I had collected his 1972 Topps card, was well aware of what he had done for the 65 Twins, the 71 Pirates, the 70, uh, the, uh, the A's of the 70s as well. Um, he, I had researched him because I had uh, written about that 1971 Pirate team. So I, I knew a lot about Mudcat. I knew he was this, you know, outgoing, charismatic guy that everybody loved, one of the really good people in the game. So I, I was really excited when I found out that Mudcat had accepted the education department's invitation to come to Cooperstown. Now, there's an old saying about, you know, sometimes you shouldn't really wish to meet your heroes and the people that you admire, because sometimes when you do meet them, you're disappointed. They're not very nice. They're not very friendly. Maybe they show a different side to their personality. So yeah, sometimes we are disappointed when we meet our heroes. Well, I can tell you with 100% certainty and honesty, that was not the case with either Mudcat Grant or Al Oliver. Both were phenomenal. We did a program in our bullpen theater, not too far from where I am right now here in the Basilic Center. Both of these guys uh, answered my questions for about an hour. They took questions from the fans in the bullpen theater. They gave wonderful insights into baseball's struggle to connect with African-American youth. You know, we're talking about that today in 2020. Well, we were talking about that back in 2004 as well. Uh, Al and Mudcat, they entertained um, all the people in attendance. They signed autographs, photographs for everybody. Um, and as an added bonus, uh, some of the staff uh, here at the Hall of Fame, including me, had a chance to have dinner with them at one of the restaurants on Main Street. And I cannot tell you how much fun it was listening to Al Oliver and Mudcat Crant tell the stories of their days in baseball. I mean, it's amazing we even had a chance to eat food that night because we were so engrossed in their storytelling. So this was not a case of disappointment. This was not a case of being let down. The opportunity to Mudcat Grant, it was every bit the thrill that I had expected and anticipated and hoped for. And uh, it really was nice to have a chance to meet one of my heroes, to meet somebody that I had read about. I had seen pitch a little bit in terms of the old highlights and replays. Uh, a guy with a great reputation, and it was wonderful to see that all of that was absolutely 100% true. And I think this is a really important thing to remember. Mudcat Grant, while he maybe doesn't receive the publicity um, that the late Buck O'Neill did a number of years ago, 
you know, Buck used to appear on late night talk shows. And of course he was a star of Ken Burns baseball documentary back in 1994. But a lot of the things that Buck O'Neill did, traveling the country, promoting the legacy of the Negro Leagues, promoting the legacy of African-American players back in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, a lot of that stuff that Buck O'Neill did, that's the kind of thing that Mudcat Grant has been doing for many, many years. Um, now, he's a little bit older now. He's 85. Um, he's had some health struggles. He's not able to travel like he once did. He was a frequent visitor to here in Cooperstown. We haven't seen him for a few years, unfortunately. Hopefully that, that'll change. Um, but here's a guy that has devoted much of his post-playing career to trying to promote that legacy, trying to bridge the gap between older baseball fans like myself and the young kids growing up with the game. You know, you hear a lot of criticism of baseball. Only 7% of the players are African-American today. In comparison with the general U.S. population, where you have 12% of the population is African-American, and yet only 7% of the players uh, are African-American ballplayers. So this is something that Mudcat Grant has dedicated himself to, to try whatever he can uh, to promote the game, to create more interest. Um, if some of these kids go on to play in the majors, great. Really, I think the, the, the greater message, the more significant message is just the idea of young African-Americans learning about baseball, learning about the history of the Negro Leagues, the players that came after the Negro Leagues, you know, that first wave of integration back in the late 40s, early 1950s, trying to foster a love of baseball among young African-American kids. And that's really uh, what Mudcat Grant has been doing uh, for a number of years. And I, for that, we salute him. Uh, he has been a great friend to the Baseball Hall of Fame and a, uh, a great friend to the education department more specifically, uh, and has really done a wonderful job as this unofficial ambassador. He's never had that title, I don't know that he's ever been paid a salary to do that. A lot of this is just done on his own, on his own dime, but it's his way of giving back and it's his way of trying to foster the legacy of black baseball over the years. Um, we will take questions and comments uh, in the chat box if you folks have any. Uh, one thing we do wanna do is remind you about the ways that you can support programs like this uh, that we do at the National Baseball Hall of Fame. We've been doing these virtual programs uh, since this uh, pandemic began, really back in March here in the United States. Um, but you can support these efforts. And when we do eventually start doing live programs here at the Hall of Fame, and we will at some point, it's going to happen inevitably, um, you can help with those programs as well. A great way to do that is through the Hall of Fame's membership program. Uh, fans from around the country and around the world can be part of the team that is trying to preserve the game's history and celebrate uh, the all-time greats. If you become a member of the Friends of the Hall of Fame, you'll receive a full roster of benefits. They include unlimited admission to the museum for a full year. Also, six copies of our full-color magazine, Memories and Dreams. Now, for many, the benefits of membership cannot be held solely in the palms of their hands, but the membership does bring with it the knowledge that they are part of baseball history and the effort to preserve it. Uh, think about being a part of something greater. Visit baseballhall.org slash join. And uh, if you uh, can do it, if you can support us, uh, whatever level of membership you're comfortable with, we would certainly welcome you as part of our membership program. Again, visit baseballhall.org slash join, support our programs and become a member of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We do wanna thank uh, uh, those folks who have joined us for this program over the last uh, 50 minutes or so. Uh, we are gonna continue to uh, have uh, programs now that we're in the month of October, Baseball has moved from the regular season into the postseason. 
We still have a number of programs uh, coming your way. Uh, we have some Voices of the Games program on deck, uh, still working out some of the details in terms of the scheduling. Uh, we also have Ask the Experts, uh, virtual curator spotlights, and some more of these complimentary virtual field trips. And if you want to uh, keep up to date, go to baseballhall.org uh, and uh, click on our events calendar and find out what is coming up during the month of October. Well, that's going to wrap things up for today's program. Again, we thank you for uh, joining us. It is um, intermittently cloudy, partly sunny here in Cooperstown, but still, I guess, unseasonably warm, which uh, we are grateful for as the calendar flips from September to October. Thanks for being with us today from the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Have a great day, everybody. Take care now.